Well, hey guys, I'm going to continue with these uh, conceptual or unusual ACT math questions that you find uh, in the math exam of the ACT. You usually see these in questions from number 30 to number 60. That's where they get very conceptual and they require a lot of reasoning to um, figure out. I've selected nine questions from the April 2018 exam in which um, students that I train have seemed to struggle with the most. And with that in mind, I'm hoping that if you're using this particular exam, these may be um, some questions that that you struggle with as well. And if so, then it will be helpful to you. Um, to watch this. Now, one thing I would like to say is focus on the logical approach because it's usually that that a lot of people struggle with. And keep in mind, there's always two ways to skin the cat. Um, so let's get moving. The first question we come across is this one. And it says in the right triangle, triangle ABC, the length of BC is 12 feet and the sine of A is equal to three fourths. What is the length in feet of AC? So they give us a clue here by giving us the formula, the sine of A is equal to three over four. Now remember the formula for the sine is the opposite over the hypotenuse. Now, there's a relationship between this equation and this triangle. So let's try to put it together. So let me draw the triangle for you. Now, this side is 12. This angle is C, this angle is B, this angle is A, and this is going to be the side we're going to be looking for right here. Now, notice it says the sine of A. So therefore, we want to define the triangle based on looking at the triangle from the perspective of angle A. Therefore, the side opposite of angle A is where 12 is at. It is BC. The hypotenuse is across from the um, right angle, and AC is the adjacent side. Okay. Now, notice, again, our equation, sine A is equal to 3 over 4. So, if we were to draw another triangle, then uh, let me just draw another triangle here. I'm going to make a smaller one. And I want to make it appear about the same. And I'm going to label it the same way, A, B, and C. Um, the opposite of A would be 3. And the hypotenuse would be 4. So we can apply this ideology to the, to the triangle with, this, uh, with, with the side BC of 12. So uh, if we have BC being a 3 and the hypotenuse being a 4, then we can figure out what the hypotenuse is of the larger triangle by using a proportion. So let me write it over here. So um, side BC, 3, over AB, 4, is equal to uh, side BC, 12, over um, AB of X. Now we can do a um, cross multiplication and leverage this proportion to figure out the length of AB. So this would be 3X is equal to 12 times 4. Well, that's 48. So 3X. Now, 
we want to divide by 3. So 48 divided by 3 is going to be equal to uh, 16. So side X or side AB or the hypotenuse is actually 16. Okay, now we've got our numbers in relationship with one another on the big triangle. And the next thing we can do is we can use Pythagorean's theorem to get side AC. All right, so uh, I'm gonna call this A squared plus 12 squared is equal to 16 squared. Now, a squared is going to represent our adjacent. So I'm going to leave it as a squared. 12 squared is 144. And 16 squared is 256. Now we're going to subtract the 144. So a squared is equal to 256 minus 144. And when you subtract those two, you get a total of 112, so that's A squared. We need to take the square root of both sides. So we can get uh, side AC. And so that's the square root of 112. Now, um, that's not gonna work out perfectly. So we need to figure out some other roots of this. So we can say that um, 112 is equal to the square root of 16 times 7. All right, so let's continue over here to the right. So the square root of 16 times the square root of 7. Well, the square root of 16 is 4, so we got a perfect square out of that one. And we're going to leave uh, square root of 7. So therefore, um, AC is equal to 4 times the square root of 7. And that's answer choice um, bum, 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 H. Now, I think the key idea here is two things, and that's relating the sign A being equal to three-fourths to this triangle. And thinking about the relationship between sine A being equal to three-fourths and this large triangle by using um, the proportion to figure out um, the hypotenuse. So um, those are some really important logical steps here. Please, um, please focus on that as you move forward. All right, let's go to the next question. So the next question is a logarithm question, and it says, what integer does three times the log base two of 16 equal? Well, you know, if, if your calculator is capable of entering base two for the log, then you can just use your calculator. But if it's not, then you're going to need to do this by longhand. And um, the key idea here is to make this more evident for you. So um, logarithms, we can, we can rewrite logarithms as exponentials. And when we do so, let me just do this here, log base 2 of 16. Okay, so um, I'm going to set this equal to y. Now I'm going to rewrite this as an exponential. So I'm going to take the base 2, I'm going to raise it to the y power, set it equal to 16. So therefore, y is going to be equal to 4 because 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 is 16. 2 times 2 is 4. 4 times 2 is 8. 8 times 2 is 16. Okay. 
now we know uh, what that's equal to. So now what we can do is say three times log base two of 16. Well, three, we're gonna rewrite it three times. We know the log base two of 16 is equal to uh, four because we just figured that out. So three times four is going to be 12. So our answer is going to be uh, answer choice A. I think the key idea here is going back uh, and forth between exponentials and logarithms. Um, focus on that. I'm, I'm telling you these key ideas that I throw in here, um, they're going to be expressed on the ACT math exam over and over and over and over because that's the part of the curriculum of the math exam. Okay, let's move on. The next one is this question. And it says, a bag contains several marbles. Okay, so it contains several marbles. It isn't telling us anything specific yet. Let's read on. On three successive draws with replacement. Okay, this is important, the word replacement. That means we put whatever marble that we drew back in the bag. That's important. So on three successful successive draws with replacement, a red marble is drawn from the bag each time. Which of the following statements must be true about the marble in the bag? Okay, so the word must is very important. That means it must happen. It must be possible to happen. All right, so look at um, the first sentence in this paragraph. A, ba a bag contains several marbles. That's all they tell us. They just tell us there's several marbles in the bag. They don't tell us what colors they are. They don't tell us anything else about them. They don't tell us how many marbles are in the bag. But they do tell us on three successive draws with replacement, a red marble is drawn. So that means at a minimum, there must be at least one red marble in that bag because it is possible for you to replace that marble in the bag, shake it up again, and then grab the same marble again. So that's why answer choice F stands as being correct. All right, let's move on. Okay, cool. So uh, we come to this question, one over four X. So they tell us F of X is equal to uh, X squared and G of X is equal to one over four minus X. Okay, let me get my notes here so I don't mess up anything. What is G of F of X? So we're looking for G of F of X. That means we're gonna take the function F of X and substitute it into G of X. So we're gonna take the X squared and we're gonna put it into G of X. All right, so it's gonna look like this. G of X squared is equal to one over four minus X squared.
Now, do you see what we did? That was very simple one, but so many people seem to struggle with this. And I just, I just don't understand why, but that's okay. Function notation can be a little confusing from time to time. So the answer is answer choice F. All right, let's move on. So a circle, a circle has a circumference of two pi times the square root of two feet. What is the area in square feet of the circle? Okay, so it's telling you the circumference is equal to two pi times the square root of two. Well, remember the formula for the circumference? It's equal to two pi r. So therefore the radius is the square root of two. And it says, what is the area of the circle? So the area of the circle is pi r squared. Okay. Well, let's fill in what the radius is, pi times the square root of two squared. Well, when you square a square root, you cancel the root and you leave the number inside. So it becomes two pi. Therefore, answer choice C. I think the key thing here is making the link between what they tell us about the circumference and um, the circumference formula. Let's move on to the next, next question. So as X continually increases in value without bound, so as X gets larger and larger and larger, the value of X divided by X plus three most closely approaches what? Okay. So how do you how do you go about this? So you've got to evaluate. You've got to evaluate this by choosing larger and larger values of X. or x. Okay, so let's do that. Well, let's just make this easy. Let's say, well, if x is one, say x is equal to one, then one over one plus three, that becomes one fourth. Okay, so what happens if x becomes Let's make it a little bit bigger, 10. Well, 10 over 10 plus three, that's gonna be 10 divided by 13. 10 thirteenths is 0.769. One fourth is equal to 0.25, right? So what is happening so far as X gets larger? It begins to approach one. So therefore, it's approaching one or answer choice H. Now you can experiment with this and keep placing larger and larger numbers in um, or substitute, substitute larger and larger numbers for X until you see that it comes out to 0.9999 and that's okay. But do that for yourself. But here it's really about the logic of evaluating the equation based on selecting values according to what the question says to do. All right, let's go to the next one. The expression 2b plus c divided by b minus 2c 
is undefined whenever B is what? Okay. So, um, first of all, undefined. This is a very important topic on the ACT. The ACT loves to set up problems based on the ideology of a fraction being undefined, you know, two divided by zero. That's equal to uh, being undefined. Why? Because zero times what number can give us two? It doesn't make any rational sense when you check your division by using multiplication. So therefore we call it undefined. Now, if you say um, zero divided by four, that will be zero because you can say four times zero is zero. That makes logical sense. But when you take a number and divide it by zero, it doesn't make any logical sense because we cannot check it. So therefore, this problem that we have 2b plus c divided by b minus 2c, we need to check the denominator for what will make it equal to zero. Look at your answer choices, negative 2c, negative 1 half c, 0, 1 half c, or 2c. Well, you can do this two ways. You can just reason through this easily, or you can say b minus 2c is equal to 0. So what's b equal to? 2c. So when you substitute 2c in here for the denominator, 2c minus 2c, well, they make it 0. So therefore, answer choice k is our proper answer. Now, I want to take just another minute and talk about this ideology of being undefined. They're going to make... Um, fractional algebraic expressions on um, this exam more complicated and they're going to they're going to ask you well which value um, produces no y value on the graph when they do that they're asking you um, to think of the fractional algebraic equation as being undefined. And when it's undefined, you always check the denominator for what makes it zero, for what value of X makes it zero, for what value of B, whatever variable they're using. This is really important. This is really important because it is part of the curriculum of the ACT to be tested all the time. All right, let's move on. I won't harp on it anymore. I hope you take it to heart. All right, so here's a pretty cool problem. Um, it tells us we have... Um, f of x equal to 3 raised to the quadratic expression. So let me write it. So f of x is equal to 3 raised to this quadratic expression in the power x squared minus x minus 2. Then it says, what two real numbers satisfy f of x being 1, being equal to 1? Think about exponential rules. So we want f of x to be equal to 1.
with that in mind, how can we rewrite one in the base of three? So we can rewrite it like this. Three raised to the zero power is equal to three x squared minus x minus two. Now, why did I do that? I did that so we could logically, based on math reasoning, pull out the equation from the power because when the bases are the same in exponents, we can then pull the power out and figure out what our values are going to be. Okay, so um, how do you handle quadratics? Well, you can factor them, right? So this is x squared. This has to be an x. This has to be an x. Let me fix that. All right. And um, we got a 2 for the constant, and we've got a 1 in the middle, a negative 1. So 2 times 1 will give us 2, and 2 minus 1 will give us a, a 1, right? So we need a 1 and a 2. Then we need opposite signs so that these will work out. And the negative sign has to be with the 2. So therefore, we've got our factors. So x can be equal to negative 1, or x can be equal to 2. So therefore... We found the two real numbers that satisfy f of x being equal to 1. And that's going to be answer choice negative 1, 2, which is h. Okay, moving on to the last problem. Okie dokie. So, guys, um, I think it was 2018, 2019, the ACT started moving into um, putting ellipses on the exam uh, more frequently than what they had in the past. Um, when the pandemic hit us, uh, it seemed that those, those questions didn't seem to come up as frequently. Um, so this is still an important question. And I think it's really important for you to know how to work with ellipses. I'm only going to address what um, this question asked this time. I'll make some more videos speaking about ellipses so that it will help you and it won't be a big waste of time right here. And if you're really interested to learn more about ellipses, you can watch those. But we're just going to answer the question right now regarding what it's asking. So the ellipse is shown in the standard coordinate plane. And there's the equation x minus 3 squared over 9 plus y minus 5 squared over 25. And that's equal to 1. Which of the following ordered pairs are the foci on the ellipse? So this is about understanding what foci are. So I'm going to draw the ellipse like they have in here, just for the sake of explanation. And the foci are two points uh, in which, you know, the distance between them controls the size of the ellipse. And they're asking, which of the following order pairs are the foci for the ellipse? Okay, so there's a formula for this. And it's similar to Pythagorean theorem, but it's called c squared is equal to a squared minus b squared. Now, what's important is understanding what a and b refers to. Okay. In our equation, I'm going to write it down here, x minus 3 squared over 9 plus uh, y minus 5 squared over 25 is equal to 1. It's important to be able to pick out which number 
9 or 25 relates to A or B in our equation. In this case, the ellipse is stretched it out along the y-axis. And so um, I'm going to, what I'm going to do is just draw a line through the middle of this for the sake of explanation. All right, so since the ellipse is stretched out along the y-axis, then this point here and this point here is called A, and this one down here is usually called negative A when, it's, when it drops below um, the x-axis. Now, the two points at the width of it is called B and negative B. In this case, the ellipse is stretched out over the y-axis. So that is associated with its normal terminology or defining the ellipse as using A. So therefore, the 25 is set up with A. So therefore, 9 represents B. Now, that's equal to C squared. So 25 minus 9 is 16. Take the square root of both sides to solve this for um, C. And by the way, C is for your foci. And that's what we're talking about. So this is going to be equal to plus and minus four. Okay. Now, the center of um, this ellipse is at, is going to be at three, is going to be at three comma five. That's where the center is. If you add four to five, you get nine. And then if you subtract four um, from five, you get one. So we need to be able to select our answer choices with our Y values of a nine or a three and a nine and a three and a one. And that boils down to answer choice D. Okay, there's quite a few things here. I hope this is clear. And this is going to end this particular video. Now, I think the best thing that you can do is pay attention to the logical approaches that I put forth for you. Are my logical approaches always going to be the best? No but I think they're pretty fundamental for you. Are there other ways to skin the cat? Of course so. And if you can find another logical way to, to work through the problem, that's perfectly fine. But I hope the logic that I've put forth has given you some thoughts and has helped you to think about what you've been struggling with mathematically. Now, with that being said, I wish you all the best in your studies on the ACT in whatever date you're about to uh, take the exam. Best of luck. And if I can ever be of help to you, please reach out to us. And then our contact information 
it is in the about section and um all the best guys really all the best y'all have a great day